Thanks everyone who's joined. We're gonna give it just another minute to let additional people come on and then we'll begin. Well, thanks everybody for joining and happy Women's History Month. My name is Wade Crowfoot and I lead our California Natural Resources Agency. And one of the funnest parts of most fun parts of my job is to moderate uh, what we call our secretary speaker series, where we lift up big ideas, priorities that we're driving and leaders across California making change. And here today in celebration of Women's History Month, we have uh, what should be a really compelling dynamic dialogue with women leaders across the Newsom administration, driving a range of priorities forward. And the, the sort of the common denominator uh, among the work that they do is their leadership uh, expanding access, diversity, equity, and inclusion uh, into the work that happens across state government. So this is an opportunity to hear from them about their experiences, their approaches, their strategies for achieving our goals as it relates to a California for all and doing that as women leaders. So again, I uh, wanna share a little bit with you about uh, the dialogue. Many of you have joined our secretary speaker series before, but for those who haven't, um, this is uh, an opportunity to spend 60 minutes with these leaders. And we have some features that will, we think Im improve the discussion. Uh, first of all, we use the chat function uh, in uh, on your screen. So if you if you know how to enable the chat function, uh, bring that up. My colleague Gita Chandra, who deserves credit for organizing these speaker series, uh, as we meet our panelists, will share more background about our panelists and their organizations. And then, as we or our panelists suggest certain topics, she'll put those informational links into chat. Um, so that's really helpful to track. There's also a Q&A button at the bottom of your screen. At any time during this discussion, if you have a question or you have an observation that you wanna share with us as panelists, um, please uh, click on that Q&A button and send in that question. And then I'll work to build those questions into our discussion here today. The conversation will be recorded. Uh, so there's an opportunity to come back and to listen to this, or if you like what you heard, to share it with others about a day after it takes place. So really late tomorrow, our, our agency website, resources.ca.gov, will have this uh, recording on. So uh, that's essentially it, and let's, let's dive into the conversation. And we'll start by introducing our first panelist named Larissa Estes. Now, many of you um, may know about the Racial Equity Commission at the state, uh, while some, some may not. And we're so excited to have Dr. Estes leading this work uh, on behalf of California. So first of all, welcome to the discussion, Larissa. Thank you, Secretary Crowfoot. Thank you for having us or me here today. I appreciate it. Yeah. So let me start out with a question for you. You know, you are driving forward this effort uh, on building a California for all as the inaugural leader of a new commission, statewide commission called the Racial Equity Commission. I want to first just ask you about the role, what the commission will do and how you came to it. Thank you for that question. The Racial Equity Commission was established by Governor Newsom through Executive Order 1622 back in 2022. And the commission itself um, is comprised of 11 individuals from across the state, really subject matter experts on the issues of equity, but even I think more explicitly racial equity and the intersectionality that equity often has with issues such as gender, age, uh, et cetera. And so um, for myself and being able to work with the commission, it's been really, really valuable, even though we've only been kind of together for a few months. And um, together we are working on creating a statewide racial equity framework where we're engaging uh, the public and community as well as other uh, 
advocates and stakeholders um, and to really explore methodologies and tools that advance racial equity and address structural racism with the, within the state. And especially looking at uh, budget methodologies, how we are collecting and analyzing data and using data to inform our work, as well as how are we engaging community. And beyond that, um, community engagement is a really important um, feature of this of the Racial Equity Commission and really a, an important piece of my own life and my own journey. Coming to the commission and, and previously um, with Alameda County running an anti-poverty initiative, it's been really critical to center community and center their voices. And I, I even think about my own trajectory and experiences around particularly women's voices and the centering of women's voices, especially during Women's History Month. And um, having had the opportunity to work in spaces like Hawaii and looking at violence against women screening within healthcare settings or working with community to develop um, a maternal mortality legislation within the state of Texas, it was really an opportunity to say, how do we speak and engage with community? And then how do we translate the needs of community into policy and practices. And that's really what I'm looking to bring to the commission. And uh, last week we had our second commission meeting in Delano, California. But prior to that, we actually had a community meet and greet, which we had translation services available and really asked the community to dream about what they would like to see um, the state kind of invest in. And part of that is really how as a commission do we take the dreams of community and translate that into what we do in terms of our administrative bones and how we um, impact change and transformation to create that California for all? Wow, so so interesting. I have so many potential follow-up questions, but let me ask you an easy one first, which is for those who want to get involved or share input around really how to dismantle structural racism, address <laughs> these inequities in state government and policy, how would they plug into the work of the commission? There's so many different ways to plug into the work of the commission. There is one-on-one -on -one engagement with the Racial Equity Commission and our staff. There's also some work that we are in the background doing called an asset analysis. And really the asset analysis is to explore and understand the existing racial equity efforts happening in our state government now and um, really the idea behind that is how do we know what, what do we know what's happening and how do we ensure that the framework that we are developing is complementary and supportive of existing efforts. And so we are working with the administration um, on developing out the questions. We're working with an external um, researcher to help do that, as well as who should receive that. So there's another opportunity to plug in and respond to that asset analysis upon uh, when it's complete and when we're ready to disseminate that. And we anticipate that sometime later this spring. Um, the other ways are just attending our meetings. There's plenty of opportunity for public comment, one-on-one -on -one engagement. Um, we are here really to be responsive to the needs of state agencies as well as the community in general. So we hope that uh, agencies and department staff are able to reach out to us. And, and I can also make sure that my uh, email address is in the chat um, so that folks can reach out directly. But we would love to engage and really learn about your racial equity journeys as individuals, but also as agencies and departments. Super helpful. So one word that you raised was intersectionality. And so I wanna ask you a question about that. You know, you're driving forward as a leader on, on racial equity. And of course, you know, during Women's History Month, we wanna we wanna raise the, the priority for gender equity. Yeah. So how does how does you know you being a woman, a female leader in this in this space um, enable you to connect between you know racial equity, gender equity? Just interested in your reflections on on your career and, and where you find yourself. Yeah, you know, I think about um, how we have to bring our whole selves into these spaces. And that is something that I look to bring as my whole self. And I also want to create safe spaces so that individuals can bring their whole selves into these conversations. And so the approach that I often take behind that is, is one of listening first. And people often hear me say, lead with listening. Um, I think we also have to recognize our positions of power being within government structures and how um, those level of privileges can kind of exert itself within community settings. So being willing to take a step back, being willing to accept some of the heat that might come from community, but then also showing up to community as a person mm -hmm. and as a person that really wants to center transformation. And when it comes to gender equity, making sure those voices of women, of transgendered, of others and 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 
you know, the, the, the breadth of, of gender um, are included. And part of that is really that intentional outreach. And some of the things that we are doing is ensuring that when we do community meet and greets, that we're centering community and listening to their ideas to how do we then engage you all in having that conversation, that dialogue directly with government so that we can create that transformation and, and move towards equity. Mm. It's going to be so, I mean, the work, the leadership that you're driving at the Racial Equity Commission is so important from my perspective, leading a large agency, because, you know, we built these programs, these investments, these policies in ways that, you know, either historically, intentionally or now unintentionally perpetuate inequity. Um, and I so appreciate that you talk about the importance of people bringing, being able to bring their authentic self to work and their, and their whole self to work. That's something we're focused on uh, as well. So a huge thanks to all that you're doing. We're gonna we're gonna loop you back into the group conversation after we introduce others. So appreciate that, Larissa. Um, I'm next excited to introduce a colleague and a friend who works here at the California Natural Resources Agency, Noemi Gallardo. And Noemi is one of the governor's five appointed energy commissioners. She leads the California Energy Commission, which is really one of the key bodies in the state driving the state's transition toward uh, toward clean energy, away from fossil fuel pollution. So Noemi, first of all, thank you for the work that you do. You work super hard, it's a tough job. Um, and share if you would a little bit about how you find yourself in this role. You and I have gotten to know each other and I find really compelling your story of finding yourself in this leadership position. Thank you so much, uh, Secretary Crowfoot. Um, I really appreciate your leadership and how you are supporting and advancing all of us to be in these leadership roles, be able to influence. Uh, so uh, I did not plan to have a career in energy. And I even as a little girl did, you know, had never thought uh, to be in the energy space. So I have a really windy path um, to energy. Uh, Basically, my parents, who were uh, immigrants from Mexico, uh, they didn't get an education. Uh, they were too poor. And so um, all what they wanted was for their children to have an education. So that was basically the focus um, growing up is you're, you have to get an education. You got to go to college. So I did and loved it, but I didn't have a plan and I didn't have parents who knew how to create a plan or that I would need fellowships or internships or all those opportunities that now I feel like seem so obvious, but aren't so for folks who don't have those privileges. So um, I, I did work hard. I ended up taking um, the, you know, whatever job I could after graduating from college, I ended up uh, as a receptionist at uh, an investment bank, which there's nothing wrong with. However, I wasn't finding my personal purpose um, and I felt like something was missing. So um, I leaned again to education and I uh, went to get a certification as an interpreter and I started my own small business. It was a very rewarding experience. However, during those uh, six years that I was running my small business, doing interpreting uh, in my native Ventura County, I started realizing that um, I was being really emotionally impacted by the stories I was listening to and had to interpret. A lot of uh, workers who were injured and losing their homes because they couldn't work anymore and were just weren't making enough money. And so that was hard on me. And I wanted to do something about it. But in my role as interpreter, I couldn't. I couldn't tell them, you know, what questions to ask or what to do or not to do. So I went back to school again <laughs> and leaned on education and got a master's in public policy and then went after a law school degree because I wanted to do more on the advocacy side and also on the policy front. And after I graduated law school, um, uh, I got an opportunity to uh, join the Greenlining Institute as a legal fellow. And that's where they introduced me to energy and telecommunications. And I thought, well, they must have gotten the wrong person. And they said, no, you're exactly who we want. It's your personal experience, your personal story that we need in this space, the energy stuff. And everything else that we can teach you, you can learn, you're smart, you can do it. It's the other stuff that you bring that you can't learn. And so that was one of the first times that I connected how much personal experience and unique and diverse experiences matter in policy and advocacy. And uh, being able to bring those two, uh, you know, made me feel like, you know, I can do something here. So I continued in the energy space. I went, uh, I was able to get a job at a solar company. 
So I got to learn a lot about the technology there. We started off with solar and then it ended up, we needed to learn about batteries and energy storage. And then we were learning about virtual power plants. So again, just learning that energy, you are never an expert. There is always innovation and that's exciting. And that was one of the things I thought I want to make sure that my community benefits from this innovation, this clean energy that's gonna help us have better health outcomes. And so I continued in, at, at, um, at the solar company and then was recruited uh, to come over to the California Energy Commission to serve as the public advisor. Uh, so a lot of focus and outreach and engagement to communities. So it was like perfect fit for my experience, um, my expertise and the passions I had and really enjoyed it. And then there was an opportunity to um, uh, support the chair as his chief of staff. And I jumped on that opportunity and it was wonderful to see him um, navigate, um, you know, various uh, uh, issue areas and um, management and all the things that come with being a, a leader. And then uh, soon thereafter, there was an opening for a commissioner and he was a champion for me and told me, you know what, Mimi, you're ready for this. You can do it. If you want to go after it, you know, I'll, I'll support you. So it was wonderful to have him as an ally because you don't always uh, or at least I should speak for myself. I didn't necessarily see myself being able to do all those things, uh, especially where I came from. Uh, but I'm uh, now <laughs> excited that I'm in this role and maximizing it and uh, doing the best I can for all Californians. Mm -hmm. That's incredible. And we are we are so thankful that that you're in that role. And I think it's so interesting the the insight that your colleagues had at Greenlining, which, you know, they as you got brought into that working on energy, while you didn't have that as your as your area of expertise, your identity and experience was what the what was needed. And you know, we so often talk about diversity, but we don't talk enough about the value of diversity, diversity of experience, diversity of background, diversity of identity. And it's 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 that diversity that that bringing in of different perspectives, which is really, really important in the work that we do. So thank you for. For, for giving voice to that, that that moment in time. And we're so thankful that that you made that decision. I want to ask you a question about being a female leader in what has traditionally been a male-dominated field of, of energy. Um, you, you know, you're the first Latina on the CEC, and then you're also doing this work as a woman uh, in a field that can be dominated by men. I'm just interested if that informs your perspective or your 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 presence as a leader can inform the conversation as it relates to uh, to, to gender and in energy. Uh, absolutely. Uh, it makes a difference and it's important. And, um, I'm, I'm, I'm glad you asked me that. So one, I am, uh, excited, uh, that I get to make history being the first Latina to serve on the California energy commission. And I'll be forever grateful to governor Newsom for appointing me. And it means a lot to me in the ways that I identify. So as a woman, and particularly a woman of color, it's one more ceiling that we're breaking. And beyond that, we're making it commonplace for women of color to be in leadership positions. Uh, and I'm also excited about what it means for younger women. If seeing is believing, then they're able to see themselves reflected in these positions of power. So that's significant to me. And then as a Latina, it means one more hurdle we've overcome as a community to ensure our unique experiences can influence policy and lead to better outcomes for our communities because we have a better understanding of what they go through. So I grew up low income, you know, immigrant parents uh, didn't have education. One of them was undocumented. So I know what it means to live in the shadows. Um, I also know what it means to need to interpret for a parent who doesn't understand English, you know, the common language here fluently. Um, and, you know, just issues like that, that you might not have an experience of if you have, um, a, you know, a, a, I guess a, the traditional folks who have been in the space may not have that understanding. And so uh, here I am able to bring that. And then as a daughter of immigrants, it just means one more barrier we've busted on the pathway to prosperity. Mm. And I think a lot of the work that we do for all Californians is about enabling those pathways uh, to, 
to prosperity. So again, I can bring that to the table as a small business owner, uh, as you know, a person who saw her parents um, work hard, have multiple jobs, even um, set up their own businesses, and then be able to uh, buy homes, and then have a better understanding of what it means to uh, have uh, clean energy and access to clean energy. So they've gotten solar panels. They were so excited about their solar panels, um, and it's stuff like that. It, it, it it's a process, and it um, it takes education and awareness. Mm. Um, and it, I'm hoping that I can help bring those types of of um, experiences that will enable even more Californians to um, be able to participate in our 100% clean energy future that we're trying to get to um, as part of the mission of the California Energy Commission. So um, yes, it, it, yeah. it impacts every day, <laughs> Secretary Crow, but I, I'm so, I appreciate how you articulate that, you know, the value of your experience and your background to the policymaking context, huge thanks. And many have discovered that you can use emojis to give a thumbs up or a heart or a smiley face. We're joined by over 250 people uh, in this discussion here today. So feel free to share, share your reactions via the emojis. And again, you can use a Q&A button uh, to share any questions that you have. So thanks, Noemi. We're next gonna move to Maria Ellis, who is a colleague of ours from the California Public Utilities Commission. That is a sister agency to the California Energy Commission. And the CPUC is a really important regulator overseeing what we know as our investor-owned utilities like PG&E and Southern California Edison and SDG&E. And Maria, first of all, welcome to, this, to, to the discussion. Thank you for having me, Secretary Crowfoot. Really happy to be here and to talk about this really important topic about the intersection between women and leadership and advancing equity and inclusion in, uh, in state government. Yeah, so you're leading the way uh, with colleagues on the topic of broadband. And, you know, a lot of folks would say, well, well why would we talk about broadband when we're talking about access or equity or inclusion? Um, so first, I just would ask you to talk about the the work of of that you're doing on broadband, both what it is and how it, how it connects to this California for all pillar of government. Um, and then, you know, why you're, you know, how you came to the work. Sure. So a couple of things. I'll start with just sharing a little bit about why this matters in terms of equity and uh, that conversation. Um, so, you know, most of the time when we think about the digital divide um, and specifically the gender digital divide, meaning um, the access that people have to technology, their access to Internet, their access to technology that would um, and how they use it. Uh, we often think about the bigger gaps that are happening internationally, but a lot of Californians might be surprised to find out that there's actually a lot of pockets throughout California that don't have access to reliable internet um, or don't have the tools or digital literacy skills to really understand how to use the internet in a safe way to accomplish the things that um, you know are necessary for everyday life, like online banking or um, digital healthcare or whatnot. And so that is that is what really, when we talk about the digital divide and why broadband matters, that is one of the reasons, imagine having to try to fill out a job application on a mobile phone because that is the only form of internet that you have or trying to fill out a FAFSA first college or do your homework on a phone because that's the only form of access that you have. Um, and so the idea behind uh, what we're doing is trying to help close that digital divide. And really this stems from the historic investment that this administration and the legislature put forth under broadband for all. Um, in 2021, in the Budget Act of 2021, they passed $6 billion worth of investment to help close the digital divide in California by expanding in internet infrastructure throughout the state, both, um, you know, the, the, the I would say the middle mile, which is um, really where the big pipes of data, if you will, the freeway of the data um, highway is, and then also last mile, which is what I work on, which is going from the freeway to your house, how to building infrastructure that allows homes to be connected to faster, more reliable internet. And that's really key um, because while you might have maybe access to internet, it could be really inaffordable and or it could be really shoddy. And so um, that's that's the goal that we're working towards. And so um, it came from the administration and then also is being followed on by a $1.86 billion allocation that we've just received from the federal government last year to help expand this work. Um, so that's a little bit about the digital liter uh, digital access piece. I, I do wanna say that 
you know, I didn't grow up with technology um, and I didn't have my first computer, I think until I was like 19 or 20, 20 maybe. Wow. Um, and so, uh, I mean, I had used it a little bit at, at, at school, um, but didn't really have a lot of access to it. And my parents, I think when I think about digital literacy and the ability to use internet in meaningful ways, you know, I'm a first generation Colombian American. And so my mom didn't grow up with any of this, you know, she had a fifth grade education and for her, the internet is just this mystery. And I, you know, when we're thinking about digital literacy, that's a form, you know, in terms of equity, we're thinking about our abuelas and our parents and how to like, how to protect them from, you know, sometimes people are trying to take advantage of them online on Facebook and all these places. And so the digital literacy and adoption aspects of our work here at the CPUC are really also important in that way. That's incredible. And I'm so I'm I'm so thankful that you're doing the work and help us understand just the role that that bridging the di digital divide plays in equity and inclusion. And what a, what an incredible story that that you've had. So can you just explain how how you how you transitioned, you know, from being that person that was first encountering or using a computer regularly at 19 to this role being a, an agency leader and in, in one of the you know biggest states, biggest economies in the world? So I was, you know, in inside when um, Commissioner Gallardo was speaking, I was like inside going, oh, my gosh, I have been there. That's me. Mm -hmm. Because I had a very similar, you know, trajectory in that sense where, um, you know, first generation, uh, my, you know, like I said, you know, we don't come from an educated family. My mom cleaned houses when we, you know, her whole life. Um, and uh, when, uh you know, when I got to the U.S., I being I came here as a child, but still, you know, when you're eight years old, you still have to learn English. And I feel like that impacted my, you know, I, I fell behind. I fell behind as a child and learning. And that impacted my whole pretty much through through high school. And I just it impacted my psychology about what I could do. Like I wasn't smart enough. I wasn't I couldn't the, the imposter syndrome really set in because of these systemic things that happen as when you're an immigrant and what you're told about yourself as an immigrant as well, because those narratives were very real um, where I was living. And so, you know, I left, you know, I was on my own at 18, had to support myself. I worked so many, so many uh, uh, minimum wage jobs. I can't even mm -hmm. tell you um, at a time, sometimes three at a time, just to like try to make ends meet. And it wasn't funny enough, you know, it wasn't until I got a job here at the Hyatt across the street from the Capitol, believe it or not, um, uh, where they I was making enough money waiting tables there to have tips. And they offered me health care at that time if I worked 32 hours a week. And that allowed me to just work one job and go to school. And it's like in my 20s, I started school in my early 20s. And I had this weird trajectory, which I didn't know where I was going either. Like I had no idea. I was kind of falling into things. I went to college, Los Rios Community College System, and then I transferred to UC Santa Cruz um, and got, you know, was getting my degree in sociology. And then I realized, wait a minute, I'm so happy to be the first person in my family to go to college and to be doing it all on my own. And also, what am I going to do with a sociology degree? <laughs> and so um, I decided to go and uh, get my master's. Um, I applied. And so right from undergrad, I went straight to grad school in Portland, Oregon, where I spent um, to get my master's in urban and regional planning. And then I, it was interesting. That, by the way, is a real culture shock, because if you haven't been in Portland, Oregon, in Oregon in general, it's a really white state um, and has a kind of a dark history, even for a Western state, particularly um, in terms of how they do include diversity, let's just say, and how they treated people that were non-white. Um, and so that was a, you know, that was my first time working in an office. And it was just such a strange thing to come up in a place that was so different from California. And I missed it so much because it was nice to not be the only other person that wasn't white or spoke a different language. Um, I just kind of fast forward, I ended up spending 15 years in in Oregon. I, you know, my career, most of my career has been there. And I went from working in it, as an intern in my first job and an intern where they kept me on and I became a policy analyst and I climbed and then made enough relationships and did worked really hard 
to where I was able to be tapped up to the Economic Development Agency, which is their go biz. And I came in as a senior advisor for the director, working on economic development issues, and then took on more and, you know, director of strategy communications and equity there. And then wow. decided to uproot my life and go back to Columbia for a while. <laughs> and then I came back and worked on international trade and federal policy um, for the local chamber. And then lastly, before I ended my career in Oregon, I was working on economic equity issues for the Oregon Department of Transportation. Interestingly enough, it took me that long to work for a woman for the first time. Yeah. Out of all my jobs, that was the first time I had ever been able to work for a woman. And I was very privileged because I'd say privileged because I was a woman of color and she was the only woman of color in the entire leadership team. And then when we moved back to California, this role really spoke to me because of the intersection of equity, community development, um, and economic development. And I just, you know, in terms of, rep you know, if I say nothing else about the remarks here is that representation matters. Um, and I was in a Zoom call when I had first started with some, you know, I, I lead a team of folks that work on this in this in this space. And I remember being on a Zoom call with some team members and, you know, my background is here and they're out. Um, Serena is. Uh, a leader at CAL FIRE, which is, of course, the California Department of Forestry and Fire Protection, where she's lifting up these values and ensuring that CAL FIRE and actually our agency abides these values as well, yeah, equal employment and opportunity. So, so welcome, first of all, to the conversation, Serena. Thank you so much. It's such an honor to be here and to be with these um, women in these roles. And I, I can relate on so many different uh, facets. I think I could probably talk to the majority of them for hours on end. <laughs> well, I want to ask you first just a little bit about your role at CAL FIRE, you know, huge organization, almost, almost 10,000, um, an organization historically and currently, I think something like well over 90% male, mm -hmm. um, and probably that same sort of um, uh, profile in terms of white or Caucasian. And so, you know, you find yourself as a woman of color helping lead that that organization. Share a little bit about what you're doing and then um, how you lead in, in, in an organization that looks like like this one. Sure. So uh, just a little bit of background. Um, I grew up in a very blended family. I'm seven of eight, uh, eight children. And so my uh, my stepfather was a law enforcement officer and he played such a crucial role um, alongside my mother, who um was such a role model to me. Um, she worked for the legislature. And so uh, early in her career, I remember walking precincts um, in, in very underinvested communities uh, like Compton, California, and um, and see my mother speak to the community. And, um, you know, she was a, a bilingual. Um, um, I myself am not bilingual, um, although I, I really wish one day and hopefully I will be, but um, I, I do understand a, a lot of what she was speaking up. And not only that, I can see the emotion behind um, the folks that she was talking to, uh, specifically, um, you know, working with migrant farm workers and listening to a multitude of different health hazards that face their communities. And so um, I began to really understand the importance of, of support and, and a voice in this area. Um, and I'll be the first to say that I was not um, extremely excited to have to join my mother as a very young teenager in this in these areas. But um, boy, did I get a taste of um, of what that looks like and witnessing firsthand struggles faced by these marginalized communities. And so I, I knew 100 percent that I wanted to do something in an advocacy role um, in my future. And so, um, you know, I started off with Cal Fire um, about 15 years ago um, uh, as a single parent, and I started working with um, uh, Del Walters, who was then the director of Cal Fire, um, and uh, uh, supported as an administrative assistant um, in the director's office, where I got to uh, work, you know, with uh, the secretary's office and 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 the governor's office and the administration as a whole, and. Um, really knew that this was something that I wanted to be a part of, and it was such a cool mission. And um, I began to promote. Um, I promoted as an administrative assistant too, um, and then later joined um, the Human Resources Office um, as a in a leadership role, um, the Equal Employment Opportunity Office as an investigator, uh, where I really honed in um, on um, you know being a part of this really important role, um, especially when you have a State Department that looks like ours, which is 
you know, from the Mexico border all the way to, you know, the Oregon border and a multitude of units and programs and rural communities and such diversity um, in the communities that we serve. And so, um, you know, I, I knew that this was, um, despite, you know, some of the challenges that are out there in the field, that there were a lot of people that, um, quite frankly, are, are heroes in, in this in this line of work. Um, you see that there are, you know, folks that are, um, um, you know, married that are that are battling, you know, fires together, and and you see program areas where you, I can I can see myself in some of these um, leadership positions and roles where you have uh, leaders that are also, um, you know, parents. And so for me, that was one of the the areas that I think I really honed in on for Cal Fire. I am a proud mother of, of six children. I have four grandchildren and um, one that I've raised since she was a year old and, um, and is now going on seven. And having that blended background and being able to contribute to, you know, this, uh, a culture that may not be um, um, very well known for, for a lot of folks. This was very um, common in, in, in my, my world growing up. And so, um, you know, I knew that with CAL FIRE that there was um, such leadership and support, especially right now, you know, the iron is so hot with executive orders like N1622, um, you know, the Racial Equity Commission, Strategic Growth Council, all of these different areas that are really promoting and elevating what we can do. Um, it's, it's quite frankly, it's, it's historical. And so um, really trying to hone in on what those goals look like and um, empowering other women to step up. And I will say that, um, you know, hearing from women that, that we have on here today, it, it takes a lot of passion. It takes a lot of, uh, of folks um, that may be naysayers and, and really just kind of going through that, walking through it, through that and um, sharpening yourself and being committed to, to this line of work uh, to be successful. And so, um, you know, we have this platform where our executive staff, um, what, what, what used to be very much like a hierarchy chain of command world, that is now really um, allowed for um, women um, uh, to come in at different levels and speak to our executive leadership team and share some of those barriers that are, um, that are not just barriers, but also coming through with um, some specific goals that they'd like to, you know, um, manufacture in our organization to make things um, you know, equal for, for women in, in, in this, in this uh, organization. One of those um, being um, a, a new uh, optional maternity wear, um, which is, uh, is actually being vetted through its final process right now, where women that are expecting and are pregnant um, have the ability now to wear uh, form-fitting clothing and be proud of who they are and be in front of a camera wearing, um, you know, their, their uniform um, in, in this line of work. And um, for safety reasons and just ill-fitting, you know, um, um, you know, uniforms. This is something that the, that our director and our executive team said, yes, absolutely, we hear you, and we're going to start a subgroup where you get to be a part of that. And so now we have these demos. We've we've talked to different, you know, contractors in the state that have said we'll create this for you. And um, I think one of the biggest concerns was, well, if we create this, will other people want it? And I think if you build it, you build an organization that removes these barriers, more will come. You have to build it in order to plant the seed for, for more individuals to see that this is somewhere that they're welcome to be. And so there's so many things like that that are occurring in terms of um, getting our organization uh, throughout the 21 units on board um, through innovative um, you know, uh, demographic tools and mapping systems, um, show, showing sort of the, the differences, differences in communities, the needs. Um, barriers like non-English uh, speaking um, uh, individuals throughout the community and, and how that evolves. It doesn't stay the same. Um, my grandparents um, followed the seasons. You know, they would share that often. Um, they may be in one area and then um, when it was harvesting, they would be in a different area. And so it's really important to really look at that dynamic, understand the culture and that there comes, there is a lot of mistrust in, in many cultures. And so you have to represent, and I'm very proud that I get to bring, um, you know, that uh, those lived experiences in my background as a parent and understanding, you know, I'm, I'm going to be giving my child to you for an overnight camp. That's something that I, I would want to see somebody like me, right, or somebody that has, um, you know, some, someone of my background to be able to trust to, you know, leave my children um, in the hands of an organization like ours. So, Really good work happening here. I'm super excited for what's next. And we have many, many goals in our DEI program that we got a lot of support on. Now, 
Serena, I'm I'm so thankful for your 15 years of service and and ascending leadership uh, in Cal Fire. Obviously, it's a stronger department for that. I was really touched uh, last week when uh, Chief Tyler, who I work closely with, who leads Cal Fire, stopped me when he saw me downstairs and said, "Hey, I want to I want to share with you something I'm proud of. Um, we have uh, full gender balance uh, uh, on our executive team for the first time ever at Cal Fire." Um, and that's that's incredible. And that speaks to your leadership and the other women at Cal Fire uh, for being, you know, vocal leaders on the importance of of representation and and frankly, a, a credit to him as well. So huge thanks. Absolutely. Our last panelist I want to introduce before our group conversation is Leslie Hartzell. And Leslie is one of our leaders at California State Parks in our agency. And Leslie has a really important role. Um, Leslie, you are chief uh, for the cultural resources division of the California State Parks. And so if you can um, help people understand what that means and, and how your work is driving diversity, equity and inclusion. And then also what what drives you to do this work? You know, you could do a lot of different work at, Cal, at, Cal, at State Parks, a lot of interesting jobs. Um, you know, what motivates you in this role? Thank you, Secretary, um, for including me in. I've just so enjoyed the discussion so far today. This has been great. Um, I came into State Parks as an anthropologist. That's my background. I decided when I was a little kid that I wanted to be an archaeologist. I love everything about people and history and cultures. I was the odd little kid that always wanted to go sit next to the elders and um, have conversation like what was their life like and and how did they do things when they were growing up that's different than us today. Um, so I've always had that passion. So that was that's not unusual for me. Um, what has been unusual is that my career here with parks really started when I was in graduate school. I was over at UC Davis and was able to pick up as a graduate student assistant with state parks. I could get paid while I was going to school to do, um, you know, the career that I would um, pursue once I finally graduated. And um, it was kind of in that role that I would kind of look around me and see. I I was, you know, in a program with archaeologists that was male dominated. Um, you know, all the leadership positions in uh, any of that program were all men. Um, the women that did work in the program were all seasonal employees. Um, they None of them had uh, full-time jobs. And I was able to uh, eventually um, get a position with the Office of Historic Preservation uh, in state, you know, in state government. Um, and I was made to be an associate state archaeologist at the time, a permanent full-time position. And a mentor of mine took me aside at the time, and uh, she told me that we needed to celebrate. And I was like, well, that's nice. You know, I got a job. That's nice. She's like, no, 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 you don't understand. You're the first female archaeologist in state government that has a permanent full-time job. And that was in 1991. And that seems, you know, it was so shocking at the time. I'm still so surprised by it um, when I think back on it. But that was the truth. That was what was happening at the time. So things have changed. Uh, I did finish uh, my academics and go off overseas. I got to work with um, Aboriginal communities in Australia and then later in um, Hawaii with Native Hawaiians on um, some major projects over there. And always coming back working with communities as part of what I've always done which seems appropriate with my career. But I did get a call from another mentor with State Parks who said, you need to come back. And I came back in early 2000s to work for State Parks. We had opportunities with a lot of bond funding that came through in the 2000s uh, to really start doing some major capital outlay improvements in State Parks. You know, we've got 280 state parks. We manage across, you know, 1.6 million acres. You know, almost a quarter of the state's coastline are managed as state parks. So it's a lot of real estate with a lot of um, deep history. Um, parks has been in, um, you know, in operation since 1928. We go back earlier, of course, but formal operation for almost a century um, as a state park system. And those projects allowed us to do a lot of work in different places that needed new improvements that hadn't been improved in many years. So I was fortunate to work um, in state parks in a role where I could blend my background with my uh, anthropology and history and culture and uh, design work. So I managed a team 
uh, for almost 12 years um, that was doing the planning and design development for interpretation exhibits. And we were able to use each of those sort of one-off major capital outlay fundings, like to build a new visitor center at Donner or the just amazing um, facilities that we have at the Angel Island Immigration Station outfitting. If you haven't had a chance to be there, but definitely want to check that out. But you know, where we were really looking to like understand the immigrants uh, experience, making sure we found effective ways to interpret that. And the Angel Island Immigration Foundation is just remarkable as a partner. So all of these have been building in my career to be doing you know, whatever I can to do better work, to work in community, um, to bring multidisciplinary teams together that can do some extraordinary things together as creative as possible. And in 2014, I was privileged to be able to take this position as division chief here, uh, department preservation officer and the department's tribal liaison and start to build a program for tribal affairs uh, so critical in what we've been doing in the last number of years to build agreements with tribes to provide access, really fitting in with the whole um, access for all. What does that really mean? For tribal communities, it's meant um, parks have been seen as a barrier. Um, having to pay to come into your ancestral lands, to uh, see your resources, to be part of where your community stories and um, uh, even your foundation to your culture is represented and you've got to pay a gate fee. And that was highly problematic. And we were fortunate to be able to work with um, our legal colleagues and figure out, you know, we can, we can open that gate. We can open that gate through mutually beneficial MOU agreements. Um, thinking about some of the work that we do in this division where we could make a difference with um, doing improved research uh, with different communities. So state parks taking on transformation with our relevancy and history program, connecting with universities, university students, bringing it into parks. We've scaled that since then, since 2020. Um, we were able to work together, and frankly, it was with you, Secretary, as well, and um, in really looking at where we have uh, monuments and um, interpretation um, and naming of places, uh, derogatory names of places that really needed to be looked at. And so we developed an internal team that I was um, really happy to be a part of re-examining our past initiative in state parks. And we, we had never stopped to really sort of look globally at our whole big picture. Um, if you think about the bond funding from the 2000s, it's sort of like a new visitor center here, park improvements there where we could add voices that hadn't been heard before. But really in 2020, when we actually did an inventory internally and said, what do we have out there? Are we still showing films from the 1960s, for instance, that have really offensive and inappropriate content? And the answer was, unfortunately, yes hadn't updated that film. So we just kept showing the same old thing. Um, do we have other aspects of what we were doing where, you know, maybe we even had an internal report. My colleague, Susan Anderson at the California African American Museum likes to point this out. Parks in the seventies wrote a great report that said, parks can really do a much better job of interpreting African American black community histories in all of these diverse places in the state. And we never did other than Colonel Allensworth State Historic Park. So um, there, this was a chance at this moment to really take stock of, and that's how we viewed it. We were taking stock of what we were doing and what changes we need to make. And it's been fabulous in my role to be able to write proposals that get funded through the legislature and is supported by the administration for our travel lands acknowledgements and interpretation exhibits funding that we're working on to um, make sure that we're reducing barriers and, and co-creating with um, California and Native American tribes, their interpretation in their places that are being managed as state parks and our African American history and engagement project that we're doing in collaboration with the California African American Museum. Uh, similarly, working together with um, the professionals there and bringing in researchers and communities to lift their voices and tell their stories in California state parks. And then additionally, a really fun project is thinking about community like we've heard here today, um, how to engage communities that have felt connected to their own own places in their own neighborhoods, if you will. And that's through the Arts in California Parks program and our inclusive history work as well. So um, I do feel like we're in a historical period with this administration and the programs we're doing and the policies and legislation that's happening that is so supporting um, making change. And I feel like 
been been around long enough <laughs> to see where we were, um, certainly through the 1980s when I was a student, all the way to where we are now, and really seeing what I'm able to do in this position um, now that I'm in this uh, role to really affect change. So it's been it's been great, and I can't wait to see where we go next. It's incredible. Thank you, Leslie, for all of your work. And one thing I love about these discussions is you learn so much about colleagues you work with. And I had no idea that you broke that glass ceiling uh, as recently as 1991. That's yeah. that's amazing. And and thank you for your your perseverance with all that. And we're obviously better for it. Gita has put in the chat a number of those initiatives that Leslie is is co-leading, including the one with our California African American Museum. So people should check those out. I want to bring everybody into back into the discussion and uh, thank you all for not only sharing the work that you're doing, but you're also your personal stories. Uh, as Maria says, one thing I've learned is representation matters. And, you know, hearing about your journeys, I think, has clearly uh, been inspirational to the folks that we have uh, participating in this discussion. I want to share a, a comment and then ask a question. The comment comes from Bonnie and said, uh, and it has to do with a bit of a critique, and I, I think it's always mm -hmm. helpful to have these kind of critiques. Each guest has stated how representation matters, and yet whenever I participate in discussions around DEI, never hear disability mentioned. What needs to change to have disability included in the conversation? Um, this, disabled folks are some of the most marginalized, underemployed, intersectional social groups. So I just want to acknowledge that. And that's something that we, um, within my team and me, can do a much better job of. Um, because to your to the point discussed, representation matters. I want to ask a question, and it comes from Christina, and I'll read it verbatim, and then I'll I'll, I'll ask any of you to respond. Thanks for all your leadership, service, personal stories, goals, and for the progress. Thankfully, it seems the focus for change for the greater good is intentional and clear from our administration. How do we get the same focus and enthusiasm to various levels of career management for positions of leadership and influence not necessarily elected or appointed? where communications within an agency are managed differently at different levels. How can all positions of leadership and influence grow the same level of curiosity and interest to their communities, do the deep dive and difficult listening needed to address these important issues, especially relative to the needs and, uh, and progress for women and families? I think that's a really great point because we can we can talk as as leaders, but how do we drive this this change into the or you know through the organizations? Or what would what have you experienced that can be helpful so that everybody, um, regardless of your identity, feels supported uh, and valued wherever you are in an, in an organization? I'm willing to start out um, with a comment. So I, I'm seeing two things here, kind of two different things. One. Um, that I've observed that is helpful is uh, mentoring programs. So mm -hmm. just being able to break out of the silos or like the categories you're in to, you know, come help each other and support each other. And so we have a, a really good program at the Energy Commission started maybe a couple of years ago. So as even as a commissioner, I participated. Um, so I could have been a mentor or a mentee. And um, this time around, I was a, a mentor. And so I've been able to talk with someone who I normally wouldn't just because we're doing different work and we're, you know, in different areas, we're kind of siloed. Um, and so that's been a great way for me to be able to support her and also me learn from her. And, uh, you know, we've had a great time with that. And I've heard from others having uh, similar experiences. So I I'd, I'd offer that. And then also um, at the Energy Commission, we put together a task force to be very intentional about what I call heart work, uh, being, you know, focused on doing things that are beyond your everyday work. So it's not necessarily the, you know, uh, the, the policy driven stuff, but the stuff that needs to happen in order to make sure that the policy stuff is working well um, and delivering to communities the outcomes that we're seeking. And so it was an inside outside strategy where we were focused on the inside with our workforce and what things would make our workforce feel better. So all staff and, um, you know, one of the messages um, that Larissa said earlier was like being able to bring your whole self to work. And then we focused on that. And then afterwards, it was a focus on the out. Uh, outside strategy, which is improving our programs and policies. And so if people are feeling better and bringing their whole selves to work, then they can apply their experiences and make those policies, programs, um, investments, et cetera, even better for everybody on the outside of the 
constituents the you know that we're trying to benefit and serve so um two different things but you know just a couple of mechanisms i'll throw out there as um, things to consider really helpful leslie yeah, I would add also, we're trying to work in that same space with training um, and being really intentional and building the tribal affairs program is a good example of trying to get training for cultural competency um, and just basic skills and um, sharing of uh, context and history and legal frameworks and stuff with, with all staff at all levels from, you know, you know, leadership in the department all the way through the staff that are on the ground, including the interpreters um, that are, you know, frontline with the public. Um, I think the other thing that we're struggling with, I'm feeling that we're struggling with and we need to keep centering is as we bring in a more diverse workforce, because we also are not, a ter maybe not as situation as CAL FIRE, but we, we, are, we still have our own issues here. Um, we need to make sure that those employees are feeling supported. And I mean, I think that's something we all need to internally work on further because I don't want to have a situation where we brought in new employees and we're like, check that box, right? That's not what we're trying to do here. And then they're not going to maybe stay. So retention, like what are we doing to support employees feeling that they're supported, heard, that their stories are being reflected in the parks and the places that they might be working and that they are not just a singular person trying to be the only representative and not feeling sufficiently supported. And I think that's on all of us to keep working on that aspect. Absolutely. And I'll share one thing we're working to do to institutionalize you know, getting these priorities across our workforce is changing duty statements, which are the state way to say job descriptions. We've changed it in two ways within our about 100 person office of the secretary. One is the expectation for everybody of the workplace that they're entering and the expectation that they are um, becoming part of and need to support an inclusive, supportive, collaborative workplace. Um, so making that expectation clear. And then the other is to ensure that there's there's clearly time that can be used um, in, in someone's workplace to, to prioritize these issues. So for example, we have these heritage months, including Women's Heritage Month, and we have these broad planning committees where we try to encourage folks from across the departments. And we were hearing from some folks that their managers weren't letting them do that, saying this isn't part of your job. So we, we built that into our job description so that you know an appropriate amount of time um, can be can be used for supporting this type of workplace and people don't feel like it's uh, nice to have, but not something that's that's really important. So that's something that may institutionalize. We hope it does. Larissa. Thank you, Secretary Crawford. You know, there are a couple of things that I would just add to this conversation, this dialogue. One, I think, is going beyond mentorship and actually moving into sponsorship. Many of us are in positions of privilege and power, and there are so many people throughout our organizations that are looking to grow their own careers, and that supports retention, that supports recruitment. But how are we coaching, supporting, creating those supportive environments to, and in, in essence, the next generation, creating that next generation of folks to take our place. And that's a level of sponsorship. And that is intentional. It is how can I, how do I put you on to the opportunities that are out there? How do I make those connections for you? And that's something that we don't see a lot of. And this is across a lot of, a, a lot of different areas, whether it be gender, whether it be race, there are um, opportunities within sponsorship, but we see it and that's how we've seen dominant culture be able to emerge is through strategies around sponsorship. And finally, I'll just add around um, being able to have uh, conversations and deep dive conversations. Part of that is building trust within your working relationships. And um, one thing that I like to do within my own team and that I do with uh, groups that I worked with is I always start off any kind of meeting with a mind, body, spirit check in so that you're knowing kind of where people are for that day. And you're able to kind of understand if they're not in the best place that you know how to receive that. Um, the other thing I also look, work to do are working agreements and how are we going to be in a space together and work together so that we are collaborative. And part of that is that building of the trust so that when you get to those deep dive conversations, you have the foundation so that people know to trust each other and that they're in a safe space. Hmm. Marisa, so powerful. Thank you for both of those insights. I told you 60 minutes would go fast uh, and it has uh, in incredible leadership on display here today. I'd like to end with a little bit of a speed round and maybe a sentence or two from each of you in terms of something that you're hopeful for continuing to improve. So something that you'd like to see continue to improve um, 
in in the in the workplace where we all work that you're that you're hopeful about as well and let anybody who wants to jump in i can start uh yes to all of the things and that were just said and i would say my you know pay it forward as women women have to pay it forward especially brown women have to pay it black and brown women have to pay it forward to help and you know i will be spending this evening reviewing res a resume and helping make an edit to a resume of another woman and those are like little microwaves microwaves that we could all be helping each other like let me help you like let's talk about your slqs i got that when i was interviewing let me help you with your interview <laughs> Incredible. Part of that sponsorship almost that Larissa talks about. Others. Or last words. You can creatively interpret my question. I, I'll go. I think that you I it's it's this work that we're doing. I think that it's so incredibly important. And um having women like this be able to come together and and or allies come together and have these conversation. Um is really uplifting. And I think that we need more of this. We have to have a place where we can go in and pat each other on our backs and, and lift each other up in, in this arena. Um, we deal with a lot of different um, areas of, um, you know, maybe naysayers or people that maybe aren't educated on certain areas. Um, and, and this forum, these type of forums and, and, and groups really need to stick together so we can bind those um, and, and move forward with our goals. Hmm. Absolutely. I, I might add, there's some healing that's needed. Um, we have a lot of communities that we are working so hard to um, work with and bring together. And in bringing together these communities into spaces that they have felt um, not welcome or not felt safe in um, mm -hmm. means that they are having to go through a process of healing. And our park staff also feel the weight of that. And um, they also need support. Um, so that they can do the good work. They they intend to do the work. They are doing the work, but they also need help in navigating this as well. Hmm. I'll go next. Um, so I, I, I guess I'm going to keep it real here. Uh, one of the things I've been reflecting on is it took almost 50 years for me to be the first Latina uh, commissioner because the Energy Commission will uh, be 50 um, or celebrating its 50th anniversary next year. So that's way too long. <laughs> However, I stay hopeful because, you know, just, you know, hearing from all of you being here today, we're not conforming and we shouldn't have to conform to be in these positions. If anything, we should be celebrating that we are different and maximizing those experiences for in the, you know, in the work we do in our different spaces. And so that keeps me hopeful that uh, we'll be able to maximize those opportunities, both for the good internally of our uh, state entities and then externally for all Californians. Larissa. I'll jump in here and I'll say, Grace, I think we put a lot of pressure on ourselves to like do one thing and everything just transforms. And that's just not how it works. And I want to make sure that we're all sending ourselves and giving ourselves grace as we beat that steady drum of, of advancing equity and transformation. It, it takes time. And um, as long as you're keeping moving and you're moving forward, um, that's what matters is just it's the movement. Hmm. Well, that deserves to stand as the last word for our discussion today. I'll just close by thanking you all again for joining, sharing your own personal histories and journeys and for doing the work that you do. For everyone who joined today, thank you for joining. I do wanna let you know that not only the recording, but also a copy of all of the informational resources in the chat will be available on our resources.ca.gov website you can Google Secretary Speaker Series and our agency. Um, this is one of uh, several events uh, for Women's History Month uh, throughout our Natural Resources Agency. Huge thanks to the organizing committee who's come together uh, to organize those. And then the last slide is if you have any questions, suggestions that you want to provide us, either related to this discussion or suggestions for future dialogues, please let us know. Once again, huge thanks for joining. Happiest of Women's History Month, and we'll see you again soon.